Okay, I think we have just about everybody. So let me just say welcome and thank you for joining us. This is a joint presentation of the South Park Natural History Museum, SOFO, and the Hampton, Hamptons Observatory. And if you'd like to find out more about the Hampton, Hamptons Observatory, you can go to hamptonsobservatory.org. Uh, and if you want to join their email list, you can go to hamptonsobservatory at gmail.com. And then you can receive notifications of more presentations like this. You'll also find them on the SOFO website. That's SOFO.org. So let me just introduce tonight's presenter, William Taylor. William is a NASA Solar Systems Ambassador and the Hamptons Observatory Senior Educator. He's going to be taking us on a trip to the Great Conjunction and other celestial events. So William, take us away. Thank you so much, Melanie. Uh, it's always wonderful to work uh, with the South Fork Natural History Museum. We've done a lot of events in the past and we hope to keep going forward in the future with, uh, uh, with more events and we appreciate everyone who has come out uh, this evening. Um, I'm gonna start uh, by um, sharing my screen. Um, and just to let you know, I'm going to um, do a little presentation. And then at the end of the event, which should be about, about a half hour, so I'll be happy to take questions from anyone. Um, so um, let, me, um, let me just start. Um, okay. All right, <laughs> so thank you all uh, for that. So I'm gonna be talking about the Great Conjunction this evening. So um, the Great Conjunction is an event uh, which happens every 20 years, uh, but this year happens to be a particularly special event. Um, we're gonna, I'll get into that, but let's take a look at what you would see when you uh, just go outside tonight, maybe if you have clear skies where you are. Uh, this is a view towards the evening, maybe right about now for us on the east end of Long Island, but for other folks, um, you might see different views. So uh, there are two bright lights now in the Western sky, Saturn and Jupiter. Jupiter is uh, much the brighter one, but they're both very striking. Um, they're both low on the horizon after um, sunset. Um, so, um, uh, so that's basically what we're talking about tonight. We're also going to be talking about some of the other events of December, a wonderful meteor shower called the Geminids um, and the Great Conjunction. So let me get right into it. The Great Conjunction uh, refers to the conjunction of Jupiter and uh, Saturn every 20 years. Uh, this year is special because it'll be the closest conjunction that we've seen between these two planets um, in about 400 years. So uh, no one around today has seen something like this. Um, so we don't know exactly what we'll see, but likely the two planets will seem to merge into a single star uh, before fading away. Um, so here's a little video. It gives you a sense of what it might look like if you um, did a time lapse of this event. It's a sort of beautiful dance between Jupiter Saturn and their moons. Um, now, the Great Conjunction is, is a beautiful thing to see. It doesn't have necessarily a whole lot of scientific significance, but that doesn't mean we can't observe it and enjoy it because the two uh, planets, Jupiter and Saturn, don't get any closer to each other now than they, than they ever normally do. Um, Jupiter and Saturn are separated by many, many millions of kilometers, so they're never in any danger of actually colliding with each other. But a conjunction is what we call um, a group of celestial objects, like in this picture um, from 2008, you can see the crescent moon with Jupiter and Venus making a nice smiley face. Um, a conjunction is, um, in physical reality, just a line of three objects. So um, here you can see what it will look like uh, at the end of December, Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn lined up in a straight line. So it'll seem from our point of view like Jupiter and Saturn are coming very, very close to each other. Um, the greatest of all possible conjunctions that I can imagine is when the sun, the moon, and the earth line up in a straight line and we get a total solar eclipse, um, which you can see in this Renaissance painting is always a, an inspiring event if you ever like, get a chance to see one. Um, this month, there is going to be a total solar eclipse and it's going to be visible to people who live in South America only. Uh, unfortunately for us, it'll be visible in Argentina and Chile. And sadly, because of uh, the worldwide pandemic we are suffering under, it's not very easy for people to travel. But if we are patient in 2024, we will get our own uh, total eclipse to watch here in the city of New York. So we're lucky about that. Um, so let's talk again about the conjunction. What makes it great? 
Um, so what makes it great is that these are the two largest planets. These are the two outermost planets that the ancient people knew about. And by ancient people, I mean Mesopotamian people, Greek people uh, of 2000 or more years ago. Um, and um, they also are the slowest moving. So these conjunctions happen the most rarely. Um, it'll be so close that you'll be able to see Jupiter and Saturn through the same eyepiece. So they look like they're right next to each other, um, which happens so rarely. Um, well, uh, but we've always taken a look at the night sky um, and we as a human species since the earliest times, we've always looked to it to try to understand what it is and also to see what significance it has to people here on earth. Um, here's a picture of the famous Greek astronomer Hypatia um, who um, did such uh, amazing research in philosophy and astronomy 2000 years ago in Alexandria. Um, and um, what it seems like to, to, to most of us, or what it seemed like to the ancient Greeks who uh, used the best technology that they had, which is their eyes, was that the stars rotate around the earth every night, uh, something like a sphere. Um, here you see an illustration of it on Pegasus. Um, and the sphere is painted of all sorts of different constellations, which in our mind, we connect the dots between the stars that we see to make uh, figures like Bootes, the crown, Leo, Virgo. Um, but in addition to these fixed stars, which always stay in the same pattern to each other, there's a couple of planets that move around. Um, so a planet is nothing more uh, in Greek than a word that means wanderer. So one of the brightest of the Greek planets is, is the sun. We don't consider it a planet because we now put the sun at the center of our solar system. But uh, for the ancient Greeks, there were seven planets. Um, there were the five planets that you can see the naked eye. And then there's also the sun and the moon. And what they all have in common is that they wander. So here's a video showing uh, the lead up to the great conjunction uh, in very rapid motion. The two yellow stars in the middle are Jupiter and Saturn. And this is what will happen in December. They will come right on top of each other before moving apart. And if you were to watch the sky every night, keep, uh, keep track of it, you have a, a really great understanding of the solar system that we live in. Um, the, uh, the classical seven planets, including the sun and the moon, um, were um, in addition uh, to those two, they were uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Um, as the two outermost planets, Uranus and Neptune, were unknown, as was little 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 planets like uh, Pluto and Eris. Um, so we uh, have a relic of of this this classical seven planets in our language in our daily life, which is the seven day week. Each name each day of the week is named after one of these planets. Uh, most obvious is Sunday. Probably the second most obvious is Monday, named after the moon. Um, Saturday, of course, is also named after Saturn. The others are a bit more obscure. Uh, today is Thursday, which should be named after Jupiter if we follow Latin, but we uh, English people translated it into Thor's day, who was the Norse god who handled lightning just like Jupiter did. Um, so uh, these planets don't wander all over the entire sky. Um, they tend to wander in a certain path that we call the zodiac. So this is a traditional way of dividing up the plane of the solar system into 12 different constellations. Most of them are animals. And the word zodiac has the same root as the word zoo or zoology, it means animal in Greek. So uh, the, the planets that move the most rapidly or the celestial objects that move most rapidly through the zodiac are the moon, which goes around it all in a single month, the sun, which goes around it in a year. Um, and then we have a few other planets that we can see. Um, these all look like stars to the naked eye, um, but um, their movements were really fascinating, even to ancient people who couldn't get a, a view of them through the telescope. They, they, uh, they were mysterious and they seem to have some kind of import for human life. Uh, Mercury um, is the most rapidly moving planet. So Mercury got christened by the name of the god Mercury or Hermes, who was the messenger god and who had wings and who traveled the fastest of all the gods. Uh, Venus was named after the goddess of beauty uh, because um, it is the most beautiful planet possibly uh, to the naked eye because it's extremely bright. It's the brightest of all planets. Um, now Mercury and Venus always follow the sun very closely. They never wander too far apart from it. Whereas Mars and the other two planets, Jupiter and Saturn that we can see, uh, wander all over the whole zodiac. Right now, uh, Mars is really bright in the evening sky as well. And will start to get slowly dim over time. So. Um, it's always great to check out Mars. Um, it has the most unusual movements. It moves in a great big loop backwards and forwards every two years. And it is also a, a very red color. So it was named after the god of war. Um, Jupiter 
is the slowest, uh, is, is much slower than uh, Mars. It takes 12 years to go around the zodiac. Um, and because of its daily movements, and also because it is such as a bright and impressive um, celestial object, um, it was um, given the, the, the title of the king of the gods, Jupiter, also known as Zeus. Um, so here you see him. Um, and then Saturn is the last planet that um, people can see with the naked eye. Um, it's much dimmer than the others because Saturn is so much farther away. It's twice as far uh, from us as Jupiter most of the time. Um, and it also, because it is so slow and because it takes such a long time to go on the sun, it takes 30 years. Um, it was given the name of, of, of a, a rather melancholy god, Saturn, who was the god of time. Um, um, and um, Saturn, uh, uh, and according to Greek, uh, Greek legend, was um, uh, the father of Zeus who devoured his children. So it was a kind of a fearsome reputation. Um, however, um, if you, if also if you listen to say um, a lot of classic references, um, if you listen to Gustav Holp's beautiful symphony about the planets, there's a, there's a big difference when you go from the, the really uh, bright and sunny music and the majestic music of the, Ju of the Jupiter movement, and you move into the very lugubrious and melancholy Saturn movement, um, and that's reflecting this ancient idea that Saturn was, it was a very sad and somber planet, whereas Jupiter was a very happy planet. So people seem to think that they were, uh, there was some great significance to when they came together. Um, uh, however, uh, if people in ancient times had known what we know about Saturn, which is that it is incredibly beautiful, um, it has these incredible rings that are divided up into uh, harmonious resonances based on the influences of moons. Um, it has incredible weather. It has a mysterious hexagon on its north pole. Uh, they might have had a, a different view of Saturn uh, to me, and I think to most people who look at Saturn through telescope, it's the most beautiful of all the planets. Um, but uh, this ancient idea that the planets have some kind of spiritual significance for us is called astrology. Um, and in modern times, uh, scientists, since probably since the Renaissance, have, have shunned the idea of astrology, at least since the Enlightenment, uh, because of the, there is no way to really understand what kind of mechanism that the stars and the planets, which are so distant from Earth, could have any influence on our personalities. Um, and for instance, Carl Sagan um, gave the example of, of one force that the planets definitely exert on us, which is gravity. Um, but even the planet Mars, which is so enormous, has less uh, gravitational influence on you than, let's say, the obstetricians, the doctors, the, um, all the people working in the hospital the day that you were born. Uh, because even though uh, gravity uh, in the Mars is so much more massive than any human being, it's so much farther away, so it has less gravitational uh, pull on us. So, um, but um, in ancient times, people thought there must be some kind of message in the stars, and the appeal of astrology has never really dissipated for the general public, and it also appeals to um, people with maybe a more esoteric bent, like Carl Jung, um, folks like that. Um, but let's, um, let's take a look at one great conjunction uh, that, that got astrologers very riled up back in the year uh, 1524. Um, and that was the great conjunction that took place in the constellation Pisces for the first time in hundreds of years. Um, and at that same time, um, uh, all the planets were lined up in the constellation of Pisces. Pisces being a watery sign, astrologers interpreted this as a sign that there was going to be a great flood, uh, possibly a general deluge uh, such as Noah suffered. Um, and you see um, this drawing by Leonardo da Vinci of all people in 1524. Uh, who was caught up in the, in the, the ferment of uh, the prophecies of this great flood coming. Um, now, one thing that made the great flood story uh, very, um, very potent in those days is that uh, we had just invented the Gutenberg printing press. So stories like these and horoscopes could spread around Europe much faster than ever before. Um, but um, the year 1524 came and went, the conjunction happened, there were no floods. Uh, there was a peasant uprising in Germany, which was pretty alarming for the aristocrats and people who lived in Germany at the time. Um, and uh, it, there was a post hoc explanation that this had something to do with the conjunction, of course, but uh, the prophecy that there would be a great flood when uh, Jupiter and Saturn came together uh, didn't pan out. And that actually uh, was pretty damaging to the reputation of astrologers. Uh, now, astronomers are people who uh, aren't trying to come up with predictions for your day-to-day -day life, but are people who are trying to just at least predict where the planets will be at a given moment. And astronomers also I uh, don't always get things right. Um, in the year 1563, there was another great conjunction. Um, and uh, the astronomers of the time, either following the ancient uh, philosophy that all planets move around the Earth, or the new Copernican astronomy, which said that all planets move around the sun, 
uh, predicted would happen on a certain date, but the actual great conjunction was several days off from the date predicted by the tables. Um, and at that time, there was a, a young astronomer named Tycho Brahe, um, who was uh, so flummoxed by the fact that the, uh, the astronomers of his days were so off on when the great conjunction actually happened that it inspired him to become an astronomer. Um, it inspired him to build an enormous uh, uh, observatory in Denmark, uh, the greatest astronomical observatory in the world at the time. And of course, this was before the telescope was invented. So all the instruments he used were just um, to um, measure accurately where the planets were in the night sky. He uh, incidentally, two years after this great conjunction, lost his nose in a duel. Uh, so uh, the, the illustration shows here um, him with his prosthetic nose, which some people say was made out of ruby or, or, or some, other, uh, some other precious metal. Um, he was an interesting character for sure. He ended up uh, coming into conflict with the King of Denmark, going into exile. Um, and landed in Prague, where he made the acquaintance of another young astronomer named Johannes Kepler, who uh, had a lot of interesting theories about how the solar system worked, but didn't have a lot of solid data. And he knew that only Tycho had the data that could um, help him predict where the planets would be at any given moment in the future, and also help him understand how the solar system worked. Uh, Johannes Kepler is one of those figures on the borderlands of, of magic and science, uh, because he um, he was definitely trying to find a, a beautiful mathematical explanation for how the solar system worked. He was young, he came up with a theory, let's see if I can right over there, that um, all of the planets were arranged in spheres and the spheres were separated by a, a set of five shapes of the platonic solids, which have always been interesting to us geometers because these are the only five ways that you can make regular shapes in three dimensions. The most famous one is the cube. Um, you also have the tetrahedron, which is like a three-sided pyramid um, and you have more complicated shapes. And he thought that for instance, Saturn being the outermost planet was separated from Jupiter by a giant cube, which was separated from Mars by a giant tetrahedron. Um, and then these other shapes, which have longer, more complicated names, separated the other inner planets from each other. And this was a sort of a beautiful theory because it seemed to explain why there were exactly six planets and why they were arranged uh, the way that they were. Uh, but it had the fatal flaw that the, it didn't really exactly match the data that Tycho had uncovered. Uh, but Kepler uh, was undaunted and eventually came up with a true explanation uh, for the shape of the solar system, which was just as mathematically beautiful as, as his other theory. Um, and this required him to take a, uh, away the idea that the planets were moving on perfect circles around the sun. They're moving on ellipses. Um, an ellipse is also a precise mathematical shape. And moreover, the distance um, from the center of the sun, the distance from the sun to the planet determined how fast the planet moved. And he also came up with another law, which, which explained how long their periods were basically. <laughs> Um, so these three, um, oh, sorry, uh, if you guys could mute uh, that, if you don't mind. Um, okay, so um, so Kepler uh, never ceased using Tycho's data and also coming up with his own data. Um, and he was interested when the great conjunction of 1604 came around, what would happen? And it turned out in that year, a really bizarre, interesting thing happened. So when Jupiter and Saturn were joining together in the night sky, a really bizarre thing happened. A new star appeared right next to Jupiter right between Jupiter and Saturn. And this star was no ordinary star. It was much, much, much brighter than any star in the night sky, much brighter than Jupiter or Saturn. Um, and we call this today Kepler's supernova. A supernova is when a, a star meets its, its most violent possible and explodes into oblivion. And um, there hasn't been a, a supernova in our galaxy since the time of Kepler. So that was 400 years ago. Um, we haven't seen a supernova since then. We've seen them in other galaxies, but they're not as impressive because they're so much farther away. Uh, the, the coolest event that any of us can hope for in our lifetimes is to see a supernova in our galaxy, as long as it's not too close, which could uh, jeopardize life here on Earth. Um, but um, in the same book um, that Kepler wrote about the supernova, um, he also would, took some time to explain some of the geometry behind the great conjunction when Jupiter meets Saturn every 20 years. Um, and it is very, uh, very beautiful geometry. It's, it's based on a, a kind of a coincidence, but we'll get into that. So the basic idea is that um, as Jupiter moves around the sun every 12 years, Saturn moves around the sun every 30 years. And so they meet up at certain points because Jupiter is moving faster. Um, if you wanna go through the calculations with me, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, Jupiter moves around the sun every 12 years. So if you take 360 degrees divided by 12, you can see that Jupiter moves 30 degrees a year. Um, Saturn takes 30 years to go around the sun. 
you divide 360 degrees by 30, you get 12 degrees per year. Um, so Jupiter is moving faster than Saturn. It's moving 18 degrees faster around the sun um, than Saturn does, which means that if you divide the whole circle by 18 degrees, it takes 20 years for the two planets to come back and meet each other again. Now that's two thirds of an orbit of, of Saturn. Um, which means that if you to plot them out on a, a, a circle of the zodiac, they make a, an equilateral triangle, uh, a really elegant triangle, um, which slowly drifts through the years because it's not exactly um, it's not exactly three evenly spaced um, points, but it, every 800 years it kind of turns around in a, in a big winding spiral. So people who are um, more interested in the astrological uh, impact of this. I often wondered what those 800 year cycles meant for human society, what the 20 year cycle meant for human society. Uh, but Kepler was interested, um, Kepler, um, even though he was definitely immersed in that world of Renaissance magic and astrology, he was also a skeptical of some of the things. He was skeptical of the idea that the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn had anything to do with the supernova, besides being a huge coincidence. Um, and that's because he knew that the, the stars, which supernova was one of, were vastly, vastly farther away than either Jupiter or Saturn. And how did you know this? So um, if the Earth is moving around the sun, um, it has to make a truly enormous circle every year. We now know it's about 150 million kilometers. So if, um, if we're doing that, then if the stars were very close to us, we would see them wiggle a little bit, shift back and forth uh, over the course of a year. We, we don't see that obviously to the naked eye. So that means that the stars have to be millions of times farther away um, from us than our sun is. I mean, it wasn't until the 1800s that scientists for the first time were able to see exactly how far apart the stars were by observing that tiny, tiny wobble. Um, now, uh, every 20 years, Jupiter and Saturn meet each other. So why is this conjunction more interesting than any in the past 400 years? Well, uh, most of the time when Jupiter and Saturn meet each other, they are um, on a slightly different track. Um, here you can see the two tracks of the two planets. They're at, tilted towards each other. So usually Jupiter travels a little bit to the north of Saturn or to the south of it. Um, and most of the time they're about a degree apart from each other. So when we talk about how far apart things are in the sky, we measure them in degrees. It's 90 degrees from the horizon to the zenith right above our heads. The moon is about half a degree across. So that means that usually when Jupiter and Saturn cross paths with each other, they're about the width of two full moons apart from each other. Um, but if we want to talk about things that are smaller than degrees, we divide them into 60 minutes. Um, so to discuss how far, how close Jupiter and Saturn will be this year, we have to use minutes, 60ths of a, of a full degree. Um, so in, um, uh, in this year, actually, they're going to be about six minutes apart from each other, which is the closest they've ever been um, in our lifetimes. And you have to go back to 1623 to find one that was closer. Um, and you have to go back to 1226 to see one that was actually visible to the naked eye to anyone. Here's what that would have looked like, a little video of Jupiter going past Saturn in the year 1226 on March 4th. Um, people at that time did not have telescopes, so they wouldn't have seen this in this much detail. Um, but it is, it's a beautiful sight. It's, an, it's lovely to think of this dance that goes on for over the course of 800 years with such uh, nice geometry. Now, if you're watching this on the 21st, um, this is what you'll see. However, I would recommend starting to watch um, Jupiter and Saturn get close to each other um, starting today or starting whenever you can, because um, the, the real interest is watching the planets move and in a way that you can see with your naked eye, which doesn't normally always happen. They usually move very slowly. But when they get this close to each other, you can tell the difference from one night to the next and it becomes very impressive. Now, um, if you are to look on the night of the 21st or any night before that, you, you can see a lot. Um, with the naked eye, um, you'll see that they're getting closer, but you can see more with binoculars. You'll be able to see the moons of Jupiter and possibly one of the moons of Saturn. And if you happen to have a telescope, even a small one, you'll be able to see a whole lot more. So here's an illustration of what you can see with a small telescope looking at Saturn. I tried to keep it realistic. So um, here is um, at the top what you might see with a very small telescope. Um, you can see the rings, but they're not very distinct. And Galileo, when he first saw the moons, of, when he first saw the rings of Saturn, he thought they were years on the side of the planet. Um, and it wasn't until larger telescopes were developed that you can actually see in detail that the ring is detached, is, is separate from planet Saturn. 
Um, and with a really powerful telescope, you can even see something called the Cassini division, which is a gap within the ring. Um, if you happen to have a telescope, you can also see the beautiful moons of Saturn. One of them, the biggest one, the easiest to see is called Titan. A Titan is larger than the planet Mercury. Um, it's a fascinating world. Um, it's covered in a thick layer of methane um, atmosphere. If you were to um, kind of like dig your way beneath that atmosphere using radar, you can see these amazing lakes, um, which are made out of liquid methane rain, um, which evaporate and come through the seasons. There's also uh, rivers on Titan. It's, it's an amazing world. Um, Saturn has a, has a bunch of moons and each of them are more interesting than the next, but um, the moon Iapetus is another one that you can probably see with a telescope most of the time. Um, it, it has a mysterious feature, which is a giant equatorial ridge going right around the equator of the moon. So it seems like the moon is like soldered together from two different pieces, kind of like, a, like something like a ball you might buy in a store. It seems um, glued together. And that might be because of two ancient uh, moonlets that came together and fused at some point in billions of years ago. Now, if you uh, take your telescope and point it towards Jupiter instead, you won't have the rings of Saturn to entertain yourself with, but you can see the four moons of Jupiter, which always are moving around. Um, and doing little antics, which are fun to see. Sometimes you can see them um, eclipsed by the main planet. Um, you can also see the weather on Jupiter um, very clearly compared to most planets. You see these uh, bands on Jupiter, um, uh, which uh, are roughly aligned with the lines of latitude on Jupiter. Um, if you happen to be the Juno space probe orbiting Jupiter, you can see much more detail. Uh, the weather is endlessly beautiful on Jupiter. Um, there is, uh, for instance, uh, this famous dolphin that you can see here um, in the clouds of Jupiter. It comes and goes just like the uh, little animals and, and shapes that you can see in Earth's clouds as they drift by you. Um, one feature that has always endured for as long as people have been looking at Jupiter is the Great Red Spot, which is a hurricane much larger than the Earth. Um, and it's lasted at least 400 years. Um, it kind of waxes and wanes in, in size but you can still see it with a modest telescope in your backyard. You can also see two moons here in this photograph taken by a space probe. Um, the moon on the right is called Io, and it's torn apart by the gravity of Jupiter so that it's constantly spewing lava into space. Whereas the other moon uh, on the left here is called Europa, and it's probably the most interesting moon in the solar system because we believe that um, underneath the ice there might be a liquid ocean of water, um, which might be uh, larger and um, a, a better source for life to live in than, well, not necessarily a better source of life to live in because we know life is here on Earth, but uh, it is a possible place that life could exist in the social system. Um, if only we could get down you know, beneath the ice and explore it, we might, we might find out for sure. We don't know yet. Um, but um, these uh, three moons, uh, not including Costa, which is outside of this picture, um, are always engaged in an interesting dance, which would have definitely delighted Kepler had he known about it. Um, who was always looking for harmonies in space. And here's a clear example of a harmony. So every time Ganymede goes around Jupiter once, um, little Europa goes around two times exactly, and Io, the innermost moon, goes around exactly four times. So why these moons are, are aligned with each other is something that people study um, with computer simulations and try to understand um, using Newton's theory of gravity um, and the interactions that they observing each other over time, but it is a, a fascinating and strange little solar system, the moons of Jupiter. Okay, um, so in addition to the great conjunction, which happens uh, every 20 years, and especially uh, nice this, this time, um, we also have an event that happens every December, uh, which is the Gemini meteor shower. So this is a photograph by Antony Cladera of a meteor shower a couple of years ago. Uh, the picture is a little bit deceptive in the sense that it, it might make it seem that the meteors are all over the sky all at the same time. Usually you just see one per minute or one every two minutes or so. So definitely worth your while. And the picture is lovely because it shows how all of the meteors seem to come from the same spot in the sky. That's the constellation Gemini, um, which is fairly easy to find if you can find the constellation Orion. Most of us know Orion because of its uh, belt of three stars. If you follow the two brightest stars, Rigel and Betelgeuse in a straight line, you get you to the constellation Gemini, which looks like two stick figures holding hands. So they represent the, uh, the gods who are twins, Castor and Pollux, which are the two bright stars here. 
All of the meteors and the geminids um, seem to be coming from this constellation, but you don't actually have like exactly for this constellation. Um, they'll be streaming out all across the sky. So you're just as likely to see a meteor like in any direction. But if you trace them back, they seem like they're coming from Gemini. It's the same thing as when you were driving a car during a blizzard. Um, the snow is moving in every which way, but because you're moving very rapidly through the blizzard, it all seems like it's coming from one direction. Um, and it's the same thing with our planet. So um, our blue Earth here, you see the blue orbit. Um, every December plows right into the stream of dust, um, which comes from a asteroid. Um, so this is the source of the Gemini meteor shower. Um, and it is an asteroid uh, with a lot of unusual characteristics. Um, it's called Phaethon, which is named after the son of Helios in Greek mythology, who was a god of the sun. Uh, Phaethon took his father's chariot one day and tried to uh, transport the sun himself across the sky, but uh, failed <laughs> owing to his lack of expertise um, and uh, scorched most of the earth uh, through his uh, inexpert handling of that. Uh, complex feet. Uh, but Phaethon is also an asteroid which, unlike most asteroids, which orbit beyond Mars and are always in the cold outer part of the solar system, Phaethon plunges very close into the sun. Um, and so it's constantly being heated uh, by the sun's energy and little bits of dust and, and other particles are la being launched off of Phaethon into space, which are what we collide with uh, during the Geminids. So the Geminids that you see are mostly objects that are about the size of the grain of sand. But because they are moving so fast, uh, several dozens of kilometers a second, dozens of miles a second, um, they, you can see them zip right by in an instant and then give off an incredible amount of energy um, as they get vaporized. This image uh, of Phaethon comes from the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, which uh, sadly has been in the news because it was uh, destroyed uh, this week owing just to um, well, the wear and tear of the elements over the years. Uh, after 57 years, it finally gave out, sadly. Um, so uh, we, we lost this wonderful observatory, uh, which could do so much. Uh, Arecibo was most famous for trying to, maybe even the popular imagination, if you've seen the movie Contact, Arecibo is one of the observatories trying to look for signs of life in the universe from other intelligent civilizations that may or may not be out there. But it did a lot of other things, and it could use its radar to get the shape of asteroids. Um, so. This is how we know a little bit of what the asteroid Phaethon looks like, uh, which we will get a close-up view of its uh, debris on December 13th, if we go out that evening, anytime after nine o'clock, but specifically, uh, the best will be if you're out around two o'clock in the morning, if you can make it up that late. Um, it is uh, cold, so wear many layers, bring a hot thermos or something to drink, uh, enjoy and sit back and relax. It takes at least 20 minutes for your eyes to adapt to the dark, so don't expect instant results when you go outside. But the longer you wait, and if you, if you have the fortitude to handle the cold, it's a beautiful sight, more impressive than any other media shower this year. So uh, thank you all for, for watching that. Um, and, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, and uh, Melanie, if you, if you wanna help me coordinate any of the questions that might be in the chat, but um, um, yeah. and thank you again to Melanie for all your help with uh, setting up this event. So um, we can take a look and um, okay, some people had, uh, uh, sorry, some, uh, I'm sorry, some people had some trouble with the audio, um, but um, let's see, some other questions are, where do the photos of Jupiter come from? So uh, Jupiter, uh, those pictures probably came from the space probe Juno. Um, Juno is a, um, a space probe that is currently orbiting around Jupiter. Um, every few weeks, it makes a very deep dive close over the clouds of Jupiter and takes really detailed images. Um, so uh, that's, where, that's where most of them come from. Some of the other pictures probably came from the Voyager space probe, which went past Jupiter back in the uh, uh, 1980s, I believe, <laughs> uh, maybe the 1970s. And um, oh, you could see the other people on there. Oh. Okay, hello. Yeah, so um, yeah, does anyone have an audio question? Anyone who wants to speak up maybe? Or you can, I don't know if we can unmute anyone. Um, um, hi, William. 
Hello, how are thank, you? Thanks, thanks for the really interesting chat. Uh, some of it was a refresher, but it's always good to see see things from a different viewpoint. And and and, and some of those uh, early illustrations from the books are just uh, quite an eye opener. Oh, thank you. Um, you you mentioned that Arecibo fell into the uh, pit today, and mm -hmm. uh, it's always been a um, uh, a standout item in popular culture. Um, from a more technical point of view, I understood it was a radio telescope, but you mm -hmm. mentioned that it had radar capabilities as well? I think so. I'm not an expert in how Arecibo worked, but I know that they, they did use radar there um, for a couple of purposes. And one was to help track uh, satellites and spaceships and things like that. Another was to take images of asteroids, like the one I shared with yeah. Python. And I believe that they even used the radar there to um, to take images of the planet Mercury um, well before we sent a probe there. Um, so you can do a lot with uh, with radar signals even across different. Yeah. So so there are there are quite a few other radio telescopes around um, mm -hmm. uh, to kind of I guess not quite replace but supplement what Arecibo used to do. Uh, are there replacements for the radar functionality as well? Um, that I don't know, uh, to be honest. I, I don't know what other uh, radar um, places are out there. Uh, Arecibo was the only one that I had heard of, but I'm, I'm not an expert. So I know that there are a lot of radio telescopes, um, for instance, uh, ALMA in Chile, mm -hmm. um, um, the Green Bank, I think, is in West Virginia, which might also have problems. <laughs> but, um, and um, there's a couple other places um, that um, that can do radar, I mean, radio astronomy, but doing mm -hmm. radar is, is, is more difficult because you have to send an active burst out yeah, there to yeah. bounce back, so I'm not sure. Yeah, okay, thank, thank you. Yes, thank you so much. much. Hi. I'll probably, I'll probably think of another one in a while. Okay, yeah, take your time. Hello. Hi, Hi. I'm a novice with all this, uh, but it really interests me. And I was wondering, um, I noticed the, the point of uh, uh, where Jupiter and Saturn form the star mm -hmm. on December 21st mm -hmm. was at 1.20 in the afternoon. How will we see that? Um, so you won't, I mean, obviously if it's at 1.20 in the afternoon, it won't be visible um, if it's still daylight here. But um, one thing I'll say about the, the conjunction is it's very slow. So it's not something that you have to go see at exactly that moment. If you go out, um, maybe a few days before the 21st, you'll see something very similar to what you see on the 21st because the planets are moving pretty slowly. Um, so that's, that's the peak. I mean, it's not yeah. like if you go out uh, on the 21st in the mm -hmm. early evening when it starts getting dark, you won't be able to see it. If you go out on the 21st um, at around uh, five o'clock when it starts to become dark enough to see, yeah, You'll okay. see the two planets so close to each other that you won't be able to split them with your eye, I think. And maybe some young people with really better eyes than me can, can see something. Uh, well, but I, I know that I, that I know that they'll be blended together for me. Um, okay. So, um, uh, but uh, if you, uh, it, it'll still be, they'll still be extremely close at night. So I encourage you to go out that evening and also the evenings before because it'll still be really great. Okay. And that's on Long Island. Yeah, you can see that anywhere. That'll be, um, it'll be something that anyone in the world can see. Um, the, the main thing will be try to, try to get out there early because if you go out later than five o'clock, they'll start to sink so low on the horizon that um, they, they might not be visible for and very is long. Is that a northeastern area? Um, it'll be towards the southwest. So oh, just generally south. look towards the west where you see the sunset. Um, and then that'll be become visible about a half hour after sunset. Sunset is on uh, 424, I think, on the 21st. Um, okay. All right. Thank you for indulging me. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> novice, as I said. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's very, it's a great thing to see because it doesn't require any special equipment. You just go out there with your eyes and see what you see. It's fun to watch. It's fun to start now and see how it evolves over the course of the month. Thank you. Um, any other audio questions? I can also answer a question from the chat here. Um, so, um, uh, Julia asks if uh, water on Europa, what could that, that what, what that could mean for humans? Um, I'd say mostly it is a scientific uh, fascination about the water on Europa because any place, all the life that we know on Earth requires water to survive. Uh, we can't imagine life without water as, uh, in the terrestrial form. 
So whenever astronomers look into space to find other places where life could exist, uh, they look for places that have liquid water, which are few and far between in our solar system. Uh, but Europa is definitely the, the greatest source of liquid water that I think probably is out there. We can't be sure. Another, another place uh, that is a good source for possible water is a moon called Enceladus, which orbits around Saturn. So when you see the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, you're seeing the two places that are the two most likely spots uh, for life in our solar system. But just because the water exists doesn't mean that life exists. We don't know how life evolved on Earth. We don't know uh, if the conditions on Europa or Enceladus are at all hospitable for any kind of life. Um, so it could just be an empty ocean with no life in it, but we can be optimistic and, and hope for now since we don't know. Um, in terms of what it can mean for humans, um, I don't think it would be a very valuable source for humans to drill for our own purposes, just because it, it is such an interesting scientific uh, space that we want to make sure it's protected. And in fact, a lot of probes that have gone out to Jupiter and Saturn have been deliberately destroyed at the end of their missions so that they don't possibly impact those oceans and bring Earth journeys uh, to those moons. We want to make sure they're pristine until we can really explore them properly. Um, William, there were a couple hands that were raised. Okay. I'm sure. Uh, I'm not sure where they went. Um, so I'll love one in there. Are we heading back to the moon again soon? It only happened early in my lifetime. Yeah, um, I, I hope so. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, there is a program called Artemis, uh, which is uh, just, um, currently being explored by NASA. And the goal of Artemis is sort of a sequel to Apollo. Um, and uh, the goal is to not just send people to the moon for a very short few hour trip, uh, as happened in the 60s and 70s, incredible, but to send people to the moon for a long time and do prolonged research and also build a habitat where people can live on the moon. Um, so the goal of Artemis um, the goal I remember hearing was that it's, it's, there's a real push to get it within the next four to five years to get people on the moon again. And part of it is, is, having, this, is having the equipment to get them there safely. So the first big part of it will be a rocket launch next November uh, with something called the SLS, which is a, a rocket similar in size to the great Saturn rocket that took people back to the moon in the 60s. So if this rocket is a success, I'm thinking a few years, the, and probably much more sooner than we expect, there will be people traveling out towards the moon, orbiting the moon and coming back towards Earth, which hasn't happened in 50 years. Yeah, a long time. <laughs> so um, that will be incredible. Uh, Artemis has a, obviously a lot of new components that will be hard to, they all have to be tested and tried out. But part of it is um, the goal is to build a space station close to the moon, uh, orbiting the moon, that astronauts can rendezvous with and then have a special vehicle that will go from that space station called the Lunar Gateway and land on the south pole of the moon. Mm -hmm. Because the south pole is where we think that there is the most uh, ice and ice being a form of water is necessary for us uh, human beings if we want to stay anywhere for a long time. Yeah. They'll, they'll even have digital watches this time around. Yeah, they'll have, uh, they'll have computers that are uh, better than the computers we have in your phone, which, which is not the case that Apollo had. Um. Thank you. Peter, do you have a question? Hi, yeah, thank Peter? you. This is a really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so um, much. I, so I, I got a couple of kids and what I was uh, hoping you might be able to do is recommend, we've got binoculars and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll use those and have, but if there's a kind of easy to use telescope that um, you'd recommend, there seems to be, a, you know, go on Amazon and there's, there's like 50 different kinds and it's pretty confusing. So if there's any that you, yeah. you know, have found kind of work well and, you know, deliver optics with, you know, not too complicated uh, a kind of, you know, owner's manual, that would be great. Okay, yeah. Um, so I will, I will make a, a counter recommendation, which yeah. is that uh, <laughs> often we see telescopes in, uh, let's say, department stores um, that are advertised, that they're kind of like the ones that like stand on the spin lead leg. And um, those are often not the best to get because oftentimes they, they require, so, they're so fussy with um, uh, the alignments, they kind of are wobbly and they're not, that's the kind uh, that often kind of discourage people from going further with this. One type of, of telescope that I love, um, it, it's just a general type of telescope. It's called a Dobsonian telescope. Yep. And a Dobsonian, um, it's just a, it's just a, as a name for the design. So they're built kind of like a cannon. Big ones, um, right? 
you can get them big, but you can also get them small. So you can oh, okay. spend, um, the thing about Dobbs audience is because uh, none of the money goes into the mount, which is as simple as you can get. It's just like a Canon, you just point it. Um, it doesn't track with the stars. You can't do any photography with it. But if you're just starting off with this um, with this hobby and you want to see things, I think they're really great because you can uh, get a much bigger mirror for your money than you would be able to get with other kinds of telescopes. And the bigger the mirror, the more you can see, the more detail you can see on the moon or on the planets. Right. Okay. Um, so it's up to you and your budget how much you want to spend. But you can get a very reasonable, uh, nice telescope um, um, for, for much cheaper than you might think. Um, that might be six mirror, six inch mirror or, or something bigger than that. Great, and that, that'll keep the Saturn and Jupiter in the in the kind of field of view for enough time that people can take a look at it before you have to move it. Yeah, absolutely. So once you once you find Jupiter and Saturn, um, they'll they'll be stuck there for a few minutes. Um, they they tend to drift out of the uh, of the frame because the Earth is rotating, our point of view keeps changing. But Thanks. yeah, that's definitely very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's more questions in in the chat. Okay. Um, so uh, one uh, uh, one question um, from Rich Silver uh, was, do you know what the Chinese hope to learn from the moon samples that they're getting? So this is something interesting that happened in the news very recently. China, uh, just within, I think, the past two or three days, landed a probe on the moon. Um, they've landed a few probes in recent years, but uh, this probe is going to collect some samples and bring them back to Earth. Uh, the question is, uh, what will they learn that we didn't learn? from the Apollo samples? And the answer is, I don't know, because every every time we go to the moon, we discover something new and different. The moon is such a huge world, um, even though it's smaller than the Earth. Um, there's a lot to, we still don't know about it. The only samples that we've ever gotten from the moon are from uh, the six Apollo landings, which happened in the 60s and 70s, um, and a very few samples from a Soviet space probe that landed in the 70s as well. So it's great for China to expand that collection. They're going to bring back a kilogram, I think, of material, which is a lot. Um, and so hopefully they'll learn a lot and hopefully we, as a planet, we'll learn more about our moon. Uh, one of the questions from Barbara is when will Jupiter and Saturn be this close again? So the answer to that is 60 years from now in 2080. So uh, at that time, Jupiter and Saturn will be just as close as they are now. But still a great chance to go out and look at it now <laughs> because uh, it'll be a long time before they do that again. Uh, a question from Richard. Uh, is will tides and currents be impacted by this conjunction? And uh, I, I would say uh, no, I would say very probably not because uh, those, uh, the, the, tide, uh, the tides that we experience from the moon are because the moon is very close to us. And uh, because the moon is close to us, it has a different force of gravity on one side of the planet than the other. Um, and that's what causes the tides. Jupiter and Saturn are, are so far away from each other, are so far away from us that we have basically no tidal force from them. Um, and so the fact that they're in a straight line um, doesn't really increase, the, the, the amount of tidal force we get from those two plants is so small to begin with that it doesn't, it's not increased by the conjunction. William? Oh, yes, hello. Hi, hi. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you, how did you get to be such a good astronomer? It was a beautiful presentation you made. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if I'm, um, the best astronomer around, but I, I, I just have always done this out of, out of love for looking at the night sky. It's a, uh, it's been a hobby of mine since uh, I was in college, and I lived in a very dark, uh, dark sky area of the world, which is in West Virginia. Uh, you can see the night sky really beautifully there. Um, I'd say that one thing I love about astronomy is that it, anyone at any level can start at any moment and go out there and, and start learning things for themselves and start sharing them with the world because there, there is a lot of great equipment that's pretty cheap. You shouldn't have to spend thousands of dollars to, to get into this. Um, and um, there also are a lot of apps. Um, I use a lot of these apps to make my presentation tonight. These are just things you can download for your computer or download for your phone that tell you what constellation you're looking at, which is probably the best thing to start off with. The Thank you. Me. Thank you. If I can be a little selfish right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, my father uh, worked to uh, train the astronauts on the first lunar mission. Wow. And um, I wish that I had more, um, more insight at that time. I was a teenager and I 
could care less, but I did see what he did. And uh, eventually I learned to appreciate what he did. And it's just amazing how far people have come since that first landing. Yeah, that's incredible. That's, uh, that's, that's great to have a, that kind of connection to that program. The Apollo program for me is the most fascinating thing that people have done in space ever because we actually traveled to another world. Uh, we, we touched the heavens for the first time in history. Uh, so the, the science that came back from that program is incredible. Uh, maybe one thing I'll, I'll give a little plug out. If, if you're interested, if you live on Long Island, there's a great museum on Long Island called the Cradle of Aviation. Yeah. And if you're interested in what your father did and what the astronauts did, you can actually see a lot of that uh, space equipment there. It's in Garden City. It's a, it's a cool place to visit. Yeah. I've been there. Okay. Yeah. I don't have to. I, I saw what he did and I heard it every day. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's a question from uh, uh, from Cody uh, asking, how do gas giants keep themselves together? Oh, we know that they don't have a core, or we do not know if they have a core. Um, so, uh, so the gas giants, um, they are held together by the same force that Earth is held together by, uh, which is by gravity. So even though um, Jupiter and Saturn are mostly made out of hydrogen, which is a very light gas, there's so much of it that these planets weigh much more than the Earth, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Jupiter weighs about 300 times whatever the Earth weighs. <laughs> so um, it's, it's an enormous gravitational field. Um, so uh, on Earth, hydrogen gas will just, if you let it go from a balloon or something, will just disappear into outer space because the gravity Earth isn't strong enough to hold it down here for long. Same thing with helium. But on um, those two gas giants, there's so much mass it holds it holds the um, hydrogen and helium and keeps them from escaping into space. Um, and there is um, another um, well, a question about doing a talk on magnetic fields. Um, sure, that, that sounds like a fascinating topic. Um, Jupiter, um, since we're talking about magnetic fields, Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field, I think, in the entire solar system. So if you have a radio, if you have a radio telescope, um, a, a pretty simple kind. You can actually hear when Jupiter rises above the horizon uh, because it gives off so much static, which is pretty cool. Um, and um, its magnetic fields are so strong that it, it's actually a little bit, uh, it's actually very dangerous for any astronauts who want to travel towards Jupiter, the vicinity of Jupiter, because the magnetic fields channel an enormous amount of radiation around Jupiter. And it would be a fatal dose for any astronaut who got too close to Jupiter. So um, the moons of Jupiter are really fascinating places that people could eventually colonize land on, I don't know. Uh, the only one that for now that people could actually land on safely would be Callisto, the outermost one, because if you get too close to Jupiter, you'd be fried by those magnetic fields. That's a short answer. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll definitely talk to our director, Donna McCormick, about maybe doing a magnetic field stock one day, who knows, if you can find someone. And um, any other questions or, or if not, I'll, I'll, I'll thank Melanie for her time for, for helping host this event tonight and for all the folks uh, um, who came out this evening. Um, William, a couple people had asked about recommendations for apps for viewing the night sky. Um, yeah, so um, I don't wanna necessarily plug one company over another, but if you if you go to um, your, if you have a, a phone, you can look for um, stargazing apps. Um, I mean, I use one. I use one in this presentation called Sky Safari, which I use because it's very helpful if you have a telescope to find um, objects. But there's a lot of them. And depending on your telephone, you might have the ability um, to actually point at the different parts of the sky with, with the different apps that are available. To, and that will tell you what constellation you're looking at. I have, I have a very old phone, so it doesn't do that. <laughs> but some people have better phones than I do that can. OK, um, thank you. Uh, thank you all. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, please uh, email us. Um, uh, visit our, our website at Cranfield's Observatory. Um, and um, yeah, I look forward to all of you coming out again in the future. Thank you, William. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. That was great. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.
Would you go? Well, thank you again, Melanie. I hope you I hope you have a wonderful night. And uh, I'll... I did. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. So I will I'll talk to everyone soon. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye.